And welcome back to You Reach On at 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 things that I learned as a student of computer science at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be learning about another person that you should know about, because this is one of the most important people in human history, and unfortunately, not everyone knows this, knows this guy by name, although we absolutely should. This is one of the great minds that has advanced the human species uh, kind of right up there with the invention of fire. And that is, of course, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, and so th this is a guy who is still alive, still with us today, uh, still working on stuff today and coming up with new things, uh, which may even kind of rival the original invention. But uh, so this, this is kind of hard... Uh, not necessarily a hard to topic to talk about so much as a hard topic to describe that this wasn't uh, something that has always existed. If you're watching this video, you probably found it on a website. And you, if you're younger than me, you probably don't even really remember a day before this web kind of enveloped everything around us and we started radically disrupting most of our workplaces, most of our home lives and social lives and so on. So this is something that didn't always exist. It, it came about uh, only, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So let, let's kind of do a quick demo here. Here in beautiful home base, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada here. So right here we have a web browser uh, with the kind of first uh, website for the World Wide Web itself. And then on here somewhere there should be a link. Let's see what kind of links we got. And we click on that, and then it gives us a new page. This is still within uh, the uh, the original uh, server that we started in, so it's not that big of a deal. But what happens if we hit Netcraft? Of course, it goes to the Netcraft website, and it brings up this lovely uh, statistics site on <coughs> various uh, uh, information uh, about who's running what kind of web servers. But of course, the magic just happened there, in that we started with one server, one database, one place to get information, and we've been taken to another. And that's kind of where the, the magic always happens, is in the connections between different kinds of information, different places, different things, etc. And so, uh, this would have come about, uh, if, if you go kind of way back, uh, there's a guy, if I'm pronouncing it right, Van Bid Van Bidmar Bush or something like that, uh, as we may think, uh, or as we think, uh, written about 1945, that describes something sort of kind of like this. Um, but even at that point, and even for 20, 30 years later, uh, there were attempts to make uh, hypertext systems, a system that would al allow you to say click or interact with text. So this is just a whiteboard behind me. I can't really do anything other than erase these texts, but it, there were systems designed by the 80s uh, that would have allowed you to kind of click on one kind of highlighted piece of text and it would do something. It would go to another part of the database. It would go to the, another part of the data. It would show you more context for that particular topic. Um, that wasn't necessarily new. Berners-Lee was working on those kinds of systems in the 80s, and it took him about nine years to go from working on systems like that to just suggesting in a memo that it may be possible to do this with the internet and with networks in general and with data that was on the internet generally and how powerful that could be. And even so, even by 1989, uh, it took 18 months before his boss would give him permission to do it as a side project and before the kind of first uh, kind of feelers of making this actually happen uh, were, were kind of acted upon. <coughs> and so this kind of grew uh, very rapidly after that, but it, it's just kind of worth considering that uh, even after the idea was come up with, it wasn't obviously, or it didn't seem obvious that it would A, would ever work, uh, B, would have any value to it, uh, except possibly to you know Berners-Lee himself and the kind of people around him who he could, could one by one convince of its merit. Of course, today we've got the web practically every, everywhere around us. I'm surrounded by probably a dozen computers here, uh, and all of them have connections to the web. Uh, all of them, uh, you know, a lot of my time, my, my day, my year, my life at this point is spent 
interacting with various websites over this invention of his. And so HTML, the, the language for describing web or websites and web data uh, and kind of presenting it to the user, that is another of his kind of creations uh, as part of the invention of the web itself. Same thing with HTTP, the protocol for transferring uh, high-level data over the network that allowed for web pages to be sent from the server or the computer with the website to the client or the kind of computer that's trying to connect to the website. But it's a global thing. It's, it's a way for information to be managed around the world and by everyone in the world. The, the kind of closest people to come to Tim Berners-Lee's, uh, I guess, point of development, uh, he acknowledges as uh, Doug Engelbart, uh, as kind of mentioned before, uh, as the guy who did the big demo. Unfortunately, we don't have a ta enough time in this series to really go into the amazing stuff that he was into, but he certainly kind of uh, blazed a trail uh, that Berners-Lee followed very closely. And the Xanadu project as well. Uh, which was kind of a uh, technical project slash company slash religious cult uh, around the idea of making network hypertext work. Uh, unfortunately, they tried to make it a uh, proprietary thing, a, a, a way of dealing with information where people could profit from it. And because of that, they were kind of skewered on that principle because it didn't scale, it didn't grow, the people involved couldn't sell it uh, to the world at large quick enough uh, to kind of overtake the web uh, when the web started coming out to compete with them. Uh, there's also Gopher, which is another kind of early web competitor. Uh, I don't even know why that fizzled, but uh, again, it just didn't scale quick enough to kind of capture the world. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee himself is a uh, minimalist Unitarian uh, who believes that quote, the er, inherent dignity of people and in working together to achieve harmony and understanding, unquote, uh, which kind of makes sense if you think about what the web is. Uh, if, if you kind of view it as a global kind of consensus or a global uh, conversation uh, that by default treats people with dignity, not necessarily from person to person, but just at the level of kind of allowing everyone to communicate or allowing everyone to link to each other and to be kind of brought to uh, work with each other uh, in a standard way. Uh, and so it viewed in that context, uh, that is exactly what he's achieving uh, by this existing. Uh, and his kind of starting point was that of a software engineer. So again, if you're starting this series from the perspective of, I want to be a computer scientist or I want to be a software engineer, uh, then this is a, a case study of that, of someone who looked at how information was being sent as part of his job in developing software and found that it was woefully inefficient and that there was a better way of doing things than just having hypertext systems within particular databases or even possibly between two databases uh, or kind of finite numbers. Um, that there was a way of, of presenting information so that you could kind of interact with one piece of information on one document and that would allow you to interact with another server, another source of data, another kind of data. But there, are, there are all sorts of things on the web. Uh, although it originally started just with simple documents and texts, uh, eventually things started to be put on the internet. You had coffee pots and webcams and uh, radar stations and weather stations and uh, entire kind of large organizations uh, started to put themselves on the web. Uh, there's, I, I, I'm pretty sure that the Mars rover has the ability at least uh, to be kind of communicate with the web on some level. So this is something that has grown very big all over the place from the nanoscale up. Uh, it's just so, so many things are on the, the web itself and not just things and documents but events and people and relationships between things, events, people, and documents. Uh, and you can kind of, depending who has the server that allows you to, to interact with the data that represents them to the rest of the world in this kind of standard way, uh, you, you can kind of build these higher order relationships and higher order uh, kind of links between data which themselves are valuable and worth knowing about and worth having access to. And so 
uh, the idea of being able to just look in a list or look in a database uh, and just kind of interact with some part of it in such a way that you could then kind of connect to a dolphin's personal life or a dolphin's personal social life would have been so alien back in the 80s when this sort of thing was possible. Uh, it took him to bring this reality to us, to bring it to make these kinds of relationships, to make it possible for you as an endpoint of the network, as someone who can connect to the network, to be able to use anything that anyone else has that, of course, isn't locked behind some kind of a paywall. Uh, it's worth pointing out that Bitcoin, the payment system that I could go on and on and on about, uh, most of its development that hasn't happened on news groups or IRC itself takes place on the web. The discussion about it takes place on the web. Uh, although the protocol itself doesn't utilize the web, uh, it would not have been plausible that it would have been developed without people like Hal Finney and his website, and Nick Sasbo and his website, and you know, Wei Day, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, and his B Money website. Is it all, all of these things were posted to the web so anyone in the world could then build from it and advance the, the species from their work. Uh, and everyone who adds another node to the web increases the network effect for the whole of the web and a whole of the human species. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee suggests that uh, the I if you have the data to add something to the web, uh, most of us, especially if we haven't done this a bunch of times, uh, will make the mistake, uh, as Isaac Newton did, that it has to be perfect before you present it to the rest of humanity. And that it, you have to kind of come up with this thing that you can present that, that has a lot of value, and only when you finish, only when you get to the end point and you have this magnificent thing, then you can kind of present it to the world. Uh, he makes, he kind of arguments for raw data now, for giving the, 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 the stuff you have now, the, the, the data that you're using to build whatever it is you're trying to construct, if you put that online and allow humanity access to that, then other people may be able to use that in addition to your final product. They may find value in things that you aren't expecting in your data, and you have no idea uh, how many people have kind of no appreciation for what they have until someone else sees it. So going back to Isaac Newton again, his mother didn't realize how valuable his insights were. He, she didn't realize how valuable it was to have someone who kind of was exposed to the ideas in the kind of order that he was exposed to them. Uh, she would have kept him and all his knowledge in the dark, away from the rest of humanity, away from the rest of us. Unfortunately, they didn't have the web back then, so there was a, you know, you'd have to go through the university system or something to get knowledge out. We don't have to. We can just set up a web server and then put our thoughts online. If there's any valuable uh, stuff in there, other people will uh, eventually find it. Uh, there are web spiders that are going through everything on the net, uh, or at least everything on the web, uh, and, you know, as fast as they can suck it in. Some of them are doing it for good reasons, some of them are doing it for sketchy reasons, but regardless, the information, once it's out there, will be used, and will be used for things that was, it was never intended to be used for, for better or worse. Uh, the uh, current knowledge, the vast majority of the current knowledge of mankind, even 20 years kind of after the fact, uh, is still not on the web. It's still stuck in people's Excel spreadsheets on their desktop. It's still stuck on databases that are sitting on computers without access to the network. It's still stuck in paper books. I'm sitting in a library right now, surrounded by books that I can't access without standing up and walking ac across the room when the library is open. The web changes this dynamic so that if there's any information available to all of us, it's practically instantly available to all of us uh, on kind of demand. Uh, so this takes some apparatus to make work. You know, there is an energy cost to running the servers, etc. but the amount of work it would take to get access to all of that data uh, in any other way would have been enormously more complicated. The web, of course, has allowed companies like Google to exist with their search engine, uh, to allow, uh, again, companies like Netscape with their web browser and its kind of great-grandchild uh, pale moon uh, to exist. Uh, it, it's allowed Wikipedia, uh, which uh, practically every topic that you can imagine at least has some Wikipedia article that's probably relevant to it at this point. Um, and this just sort of massive uh, 
combination of knowledge is, is present and available uh, for anyone. Uh, it, I don't know how you would not know about it at this point, uh, but these are things that were not available as recent as 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, if you wanted an encyclopedia, you probably had to shell out a whole bunch of money, take up a whole bunch of space on your bookshelf, and God forbid if you were homeless or didn't have access to a bookshelf or your apartment was too small to fit more books or something like that. You know, it was just not feasible to have access to an encyclopedic uh, set of information that you could then use to educate yourself on topics that were wide-ranging. Uh, so, kind of in short, uh, you know, do your bit for the web, even if it's just a little bit, but make sure it's connected, it's published online in a standard way. Uh, the web allows people to kind of build from that, uh, and it allows you to be kind of built upon. And uh, you, you can look at Tim Berners-Lee and how he changed the world and how he suggests to change the world. Uh, he suggests that the world is and can only really be changed one piece at a time. And the, the art is picking that piece. Uh, when you have and use the web, uh, find out who's working in the area that you want to change. Acquaintance yourself with the vocabulary that they use uh, for talking about that kind of topic. Uh, find a way to explain your new idea in their terms, and then after you've understood it uh, and why it hasn't been done that way, uh, then suggest your change. Uh, if the idea is in computer science uh, and in computing, then you may want to write some code to also kind of help clarify your particular idea for a change. Then once you've done all of that, then you can kind of start doing other stuff. But he knows because he's done it, and this is the path that has led uh, to successful change in all sorts of areas. Uh, kind of a piece. This is, uh, of course, related to other videos we've talked about. Uh, in particular, the uh, grades video, uh, because you wouldn't believe how hard it is to convey what classes you've been ta or you've taken to other people. You know, in the past, you'd actually have to print off. First of all, you'd have to get permission uh, to print off on paper a piece of paper with a list of your classes, which more often than not were just four-letter combinations uh, of you know, some topic uh, with no context. So if you didn't know uh, what, for example, uh, user interface design was, you couldn't then be curious and kind of click through and go into it yourself to kind of your, or reacquaint yourself with the information in the course if you were a kind of a neutral observer trying to kind of gauge what this person who's kind of showing you what classes they took has actually done with their time. It's related to the forest and trees video because this is kind of a, an example that uh, transcends both, that it involves the highest, the high level thinking when we start talking about the relationships between general kinds of things. But at the same time, it needs to be implemented on the low side. Uh, and there has to be from the entire stack uh, available tools to make this work. Um, the web is of course related to the procrastination and red herring arguments because you can get lost in it extremely easily uh, and even Tim Berners-Lee has kind of mentioned how easy it is to get lost and the natural sense of wonder that results when you just kind of acknowledge how massive the, the knowledge base of humanity is and how close you're, you can get to it while at the same time being kind of really really small in relation to it. It's related to the Nord video because uh, the problem of undefined terms, again, uh, hypertext and the web allow you to approach the problem of undefined terms in a new way, uh, or at least new as of this past 20 years. Uh, and again, this is only really possible because of the web. Uh, dimensional analysis. Uh, it's worth w pointing out that the, uh, the web exhibits uh, properties uh, on its own. It's, it's a huge thing. It, 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 it's, it's extremely massive. But it's, it's big enough to actually have its own kind of developed properties that were unpredictable at the time that it was developed. Uh, and so some of these properties are things that have not been thought of and found yet. Uh, and if you're clever enough and you're, if you're interested in scale-free networks enough to look at it, uh, you might be the person to discover a property of large networks of human beings communicating with each other that everyone sees but no one recognizes yet. So this is kind of an opportunity for you. Uh, it's of course related to the different approaches uh, video because different approaches flourish on the web. The, when everyone has access to a topic, we can approach it from different angles, from different sides, 
uh, and many people can get involved with different perspectives. It's related to the Great White Combine video because the web ideally allows you to transcend limits imposed on you from your local community and by directly interfacing with the world at large. Uh, it's related to the You Are a Cockroach video because, in fact, we can hook up cockroaches to the web. It's awesome. There are definitely robotic cockroaches out there. And if you really want to tell the difference between people and cockroaches, you actually have a place to start. Uh, it's related to the argument from incredulity because it's possible to find extremely strange people on the web. I might be one of them, in fact. Uh, but they're never that far away. Uh, in the past, you would have to travel you know, miles to find someone with a different language or a, a, a different kind of worldview than you. Uh, and the further you know, away in terms of your worldview, the harder it would be to find them. Uh, and some people, of course, never did. They would only stay in their community, only be exposed to things that they're kind of used to. Whereas the web forces us to acknowledge the vast difference between different parts of humanity, the vast kind of separation between worldviews, the vast kind of uh, multiculturalism that's inherent in the world th that we live in. It's related to the argument from ignorance, because with the web, you really don't have as much of an excuse for being ignorant anymore, and you certainly don't have as much of an excuse for acting or arguing based on ignorance itself. Um, so as an example of this this week, one of the people in this space uh, got into an argument where he tried to argument or argue that lightning usually goes from the ground to the cloud, uh, and other people tried to argue otherwise. But one of those the sides of this argument actually brought up on the web evidence, video evidence of a lightning bolt going in slow motion uh, from the cloud to the ground. And so this is something that you know you can't just be ignorant of things and assume that you know there you don't have access to information to know otherwise, because you probably do. For the vast, maybe even majority of topics, there's at least some data that will guide you if you're curious about something on the web. The same goes for the politician syllogism, because the web allows us to find other options for activity that we could do uh, to address some situations, if there are any, if anyone's ever thought of some before, which given how big the web is, is increasingly likely related to the argument from authority because the web has a kind of interesting relationship to authority in that uh, everyone who connects to the web kind of has the ability to say things in a certain way. Uh, and regardless of legal right or wrong, regardless of moral right or wrong, uh, there is this kind of evenness between our ability to communicate, our ability to link to one another uh, that kind of undermines a lot of different ways of perceiving what authority is and what their justification for having it is. Uh, it's related to the Proverbs video. As we mentioned, most of what we talked about was in relation to those silly cat picture memes, which, of course, are only possible on the web. Yes, there were pictures of cats before, but there's something inherently different about pictures of cats with text on them being served to you on a website. There's just something that it was not present until you had those combination of things together. Uh, it's related to artificial intelligence and epistemology because the web is basically a knowledge network. Uh, it's not a very complicated one as far as knowledge networks go, but it definitely applies or implies things about epistemology, about knowledge, about intelligence. And if we're not careful about how we're thinking about intelligence and how we're thinking about knowledge, we can very easily define the web as intelligent or knowledgeable. Uh, I personally wouldn't go that far. I think it's just you know, text that is relating to each other. Uh, but, uh, again, depending how you model it, it may, you may run into difficulties, and this may be uh, something worth considering. Uh, and so, uh, it's also related to the Vint Cerf video, because Vint Cerf is the person who made this possible. Without Vint Cerf's internet being able to connect people on a physical way, uh, this would not have happened. The web would not be here, and Sim Sim Berners Lee would probably just still be a CERN doing uh, hypertext programs, which who knows how far you would have gone by now. But uh, again, that, that was kind of an important precursor. Um, and uh, so this allowed, I mean, even with the internet, yes, everyone was connected, and yes, everyone could communicate with each other. But in practice, it was hard. You'd have to communicate locally and kind of expand outwards. It wasn't easy to coordinate high-level activity uh, without this thing that allowed us to communicate in this much, much more efficient way. Uh, and so Tim Berners-Lee has realistically 
connected more people together than ev anyone else in the history of humankind. No empire, no kingdom, no religious figure uh, has ever connected as many people to as close to each other and on as deep of a level uh, to each other as he has. The only one who really came close was Gutenberg before him, the inventor of the printing press. Uh, in terms of people who have the ability and have done so, or have used it to tr transform the nature of social reality. And like other technical greats, uh, Kim Berners-Lee has been accused of hacking. So this is kind of another kind of way of gauging how important or how valuable their contribution is, because at a certain point you start getting accused of uh, kind of this, this crime of using technology against the will of the kind of owner of a computer, uh, but usually by people who don't understand exactly how the computer works and what is being displayed on their screen. In the case of Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, sometimes you can get something by a net stat that shows you uh, who is connected to your computer. Uh, and for all web connections, his email address used to be listed at least at one point. Uh, and so people would accuse him of, of hacking them. And so we very nearly could have lost uh, this genius to the, for example, US prison system. There are many people, usually teenagers, who get, kind of get swept up and charged with hacking and thrown into prison uh, for doing so, uh, and for doing things that were uh, very similar to the, the kind of thing that he created with the first website, the first web browser, etc. So it's kind of worth thinking about that. Um, example websites. YouTube, where you're watching this video. I'm pronouncing that right, right the Environmental Canada we uh, website uh, for weather in, for example, the Thunder Bay area. And of course, other things online as well, uh, which you may or may not want to click on. But uh, the, the point is that there's all sorts of things on the website, or on the web. There are things that you would never think of in your wildest dreams on the web, ready for you to interact with them. Thank you, Tim Berners-Lee, for making this thing and connecting the world. Um, as usual, uh, if you have any questions about uh, the great uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, I can try to field them. Uh, he is, of course, still on the web himself, so if you're curious, you can also probably ask him. Uh, and I'll see if I can find a donation uh, address for the W3C so I can put on the bottom of this video as a kind of big thank you for that. Uh, and uh, as usual, hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.